Shiva Prabhupada Ki Jai. So it's February 15th, 2015 in Melbourne. We're going to be doing an overview of the Bhagavatam second canto, and this is not going to be anything like yesterday's class, so if that's what you came expecting, you probably should leave because it's, it's not a story. <laughs> So we're first going to look at a summary of the chapters in the second canto. It's, what's really nice about second canto Bhagavatam, sec, the first and second canto Bhagavatam are compared to the Lord's lotus feet. And this is really our way of approaching the Lord. What's also particularly wonderful about the second canto, I find this in the second, the third, and the eleventh canto, uh, especially, of course, a little bit in other places, is there's a whole philosophy of how the world works. What is, what is the nature of the world? How does it work? You know, modern philosophers, they're always trying to figure out who are we, what are we doing here, what's real, what's not real, how do we know what we perceive? And all these questions are answered in the Bhagavatam, and this is particularly one of those places. Also, what's really nice about the second canto is it gives us, in many ways, a key to how to be Krishna conscious, how to be spiritual and enlightened, even within the world without renouncing the world, while functioning in the world. So this is just a little summary of the chapters. So the first chapter talks about detachment and the universal form. The second chapter about, again, detachment, living simply, and description of the Lord in the heart. Then the third, worship of the demigods for material purposes, the uselessness of a life without love of God. Then Pariket asking questions and Sukadeva glorifying the Lord and referring to Narada and Brahma. This is a re recurrent theme or method in the Bhagavatam that there's a story within a story within a story within a story within a story. Someone's asking questions, like even in yesterday's class, right? It's Uttara asking Pariket, and Pariket tells her the story of the Mathura Brahmana, who then hears the story of Gopal Kumar. So it's Gopal Kumar talking to the Brahmana and Pariket talking to Uttara, and then even with Gopal Kumar, there's Narada talking to Gopal Kumar, and the scriptures talking to each other, and all these dialogues and stories within each other. Right, then, there's, then we go to Narada's questions, and Brahma's description of the first creation, then the secondary creation, the senses of the universal form, sacrifices, pastime incarnations is a really sweet chapter. Chapter 7, all the incarnations of the Lord. And then uh, Pariket asking questions about the universe. And then uh, one of the most chap important chapters in the whole Bhagavatam that have the four original verses of the Bhagavatam, which Lord Vishnu spoke to Brahma. And then the ten divisions of the Bhagavatam. And again, a description of the universal form. So how many universal forms are described in the second? How many times is a universal form described in the second canto? Three times. Okay, let's look at chapter one. These are some key or important verses from chapter one that you have probably heard. If you regularly listen to Srila Prabhupada's lectures, if you regularly read in Srila Prabhupada's books, these are verses that you will encounter over and over again. And these are some of the verses in the first chapter. Persons devoid of atmatattva do not inquire into the problems of life being too attached to the fallible soldiers. They do not see their inevitable destruction. So it's, this is a, one of the main points that Srila Prabhupada makes. Our shelters in this world are fallible. They're like plastic soldiers. You know, they may look a little bit like soldiers, but they can't protect you. So, What are our fallible soldiers? Our body? Our body is our shelter? Is our body reliable? Can you rely on your body? No. What about the mind, right? And minds, can you rely on your mind? No. Another one is our, our family and friends, other people. What do you say? Can you rely on them? Sometimes. A little bit. Okay. Another one is our things. Can you rely on your things? No. So none of these are absolute shelters. Right? I mean, I pretty much figure that when I wake up in the morning, my body's going to get out of bed and I'm going to be able to walk. But maybe not. Right? I can pretty much figure... You know, if I need to know something and I ask my mind, where is it, my mind will know the answer. But maybe not. I pretty much know that if I need something, I can call out one of my family members, can you help me out? But maybe they'll say no. Pretty much I know when I turn on my equipment, it'll work and do what I want it to do. But maybe not. So they're fallible soldiers. And these are people, we rely on these fallible soldiers if we don't know the truth of the self. And then this next verse 
One who desires to be free from all miseries must hear about glorifying and also remember the personality of Godhead. So this is the essence of bhakti, yes? Hear about glorifying, remember. Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam. And then the very next verse, the perfect perfection of everything that we do. What's the perfection of everything we do? Is to remember the personality of Godhead at the time of death. Why at the time of death? Because at the time of death, we grab that which is most important to us. And one time, I had my students on a field trip. And on our way back to the school, we saw these huge billows of smoke in the sky. And the kids said, I want to go see what that is. And it was an apartment complex on fire. It took a half an hour before we could go close enough to the building till the firemen to put down the flames. And then we saw a young woman standing on the sidewalk, barefoot, with her three little children. So, you know, your house is burning down. You grab your kids. You don't grab your wallet. You don't grab your family photos. You know, you grab your kids. So at the time of death, we, take, we try to grab on to what's most important to us. We can say spiritual life is most important. But the test is, what do we grab at the time of death? So that time of death, yam yam vapis ram bhavam twaja chan tekalevram, tam tam evetikontaya sadatad bhava bhavita. That really indicates what are our desires. Because Krishna, eka um, nitya nitya nam chaitanya chaitanya nam, eka bahunam yo vidadati kaman. And as it said in the Isha Upanishad, he's a self sufficient philosopher who's been fulfilling everyone's desires since time immemorial. So how do we know what our real desires are is what we grab on at the time of death. So the perfection is if what we grab at the time of death is the Lord. Because then we just get the Lord and we don't get anything else. Okay, then there's a meditation on the super soul as realized through the Astanga Yoga practices. And this is described in chapter 1, 6, and 10. Well, three times in the second canto has described how the yogi, by meditating on the different chakras of the body and the airs within the body, can realize a connection to the super soul, can realize a connection to the universal form. How the, how the material world is the body of the Lord. Well, that's very useful, right? If you say, how can I see God? But I can see God as the universe. Like we see God as the deity, we see God in the paintings. We can also see God as the universe, with the universal body described as the different planetary systems are resting on different parts of that universal body. And the same with the different sense organs, that each of, each of our sense organs... This is, any of you who study philosophy on an academic level, or maybe by the time, if you can remember this, by the time you go to college or later on, if you take class in philosophy, one of my grandsons is taking a class in philosophy of art. So at the undergraduate level, I took a graduate course in philosophy of science. And this is one of the main things that they look at. How do we perceive anything? Who's perceiving? What's perceiving? What's the process of perceiving? Right? Because the light enters your eyes, and you all know the image gets flipped. Do you remember that? from school, that the image is upside down on your retina. And then it goes to the optic nerve, and it goes to the brain. But who, who's really perceiving? Who's perceiving that, you know, there's someone sitting over there with a hat sideways, and there's an exit sign with some green man running out of a green door, and there's a clock there and a fan there. Who's perceive what's this process by which we're perceiving? And the bigger question is, of course, how do we know that what we're perceiving is actually what is? By the way, can we know that for sure? That what I'm perceiving is what is? Do I know for sure there's really a gentleman over there wearing a hat to the side? I do not know that. Now, he could tell me, I'm sitting over here, my hat's off to the side, but he could be just as illusioned as I am. Isn't that correct? Yes? Uh, we talked about this a little bit the other day. That the way we understand reality, that something's real, is that everybody agrees to it. Yeah? Everybody will agree that there's three fans in this room and they're all moving. And they're all moving in a 
counterclockwise direction. So we would all agree to that, but that doesn't mean that it's true. And the biggest example in modern society is the computer game, where we could all be playing a computer game and we would all have the same experience, but none of it would be real. We could cre all create a virtual character that was in a virtual room where there were fans rotating, and we would all agree, yes, there are fans rotating, but there wouldn't have been. There would have been just ones and zeros. So the fact that we're all having the same experience, or a very similar experience, doesn't mean, by the way, your hat was fine, doesn't mean that it's, it's actually what's happening in reality. And this is the biggest question for philosophers. Is there an objective reality independent of our mind and our sense perception? And if there is, how do, we, how do we find it out? Because all we have is our mind and our sense perception. How, how do we access that? This is the big question for philosophy. And these are the kind of questions that are dealt with here. What are the senses? What is sense perception? How does sense perception happen? What is the interface? Uh, our scientists would talk about this a lot, that if we're not the body, how are we perceiving what's in the body? How does that happen? So this is described here that there is a, a link between a demigod and the sense perception and the sense object. And then the soul is able to pick up on the subtle body and, and get that perception. Okay, moving on to chapter two. Here we have a wonderful description, again, of the universal form. And uh, I talk a lot in my, in my classes about how we can meditate on Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita. And usually I use the Bhagavad Gita because I'm assuming that most people are more familiar with the Bhagavad Gita. But there are also these wonderful descriptions in the Bhagavatam. Like varieties of birds are indications of his masterful artistic sense. Think of how incredibly beautiful are the different varieties of birds. Celestial species... Are, all represent his musical rhythm. Even the demoniac soldiers represent his prowess. So how the different creatures and entities in the universe are all in this universal body of the Lord, indicative of one of his potencies, that everything we're experiencing, everything we're seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, is all indicative of some sort of prowess or shakti of the Lord. Then we have this detachment. Of course, this is spoken by Sukadev Goswami who was living even without clothes. So he really traveled light, huh? <laughs> and not even, a, not even clothes, what to speak of a bag. So he said, when you can lie on the earth, why do you need beds? When you have arms, why do you need a pillow? When you have your hands, why do you need spoons and forks? When there's uh, tree bark, why do you need clothing? Of course, they wouldn't just wear the bark as bark. They'd pound it into a fabric. Non-permanent names only. We talk about how the world is just a, the world of names. We call this a table. But it wasn't a table a little while ago. It was a, it was a tree. Before it was a tree, it was what? It was a seed. And how did it get from a seed to a tree? Sunlight. It was sunlight and water. And then someday it will be burned, perhaps. And when it burns, then again it will manifest the, le the heat and light from the sun. The water will come out as smoke. The earth minerals will come out as ashes. So that means it's just a na it's, we're just giving this a name right now that it's a table. It's not what it is. If something is something, it is, then it is that something eternally. It is that something always in the past, in the present, in the future. Therefore, Krishna says, of the eternal, there's no cessation. So something that's real is always that thing. It doesn't change. Like we, the soul, we're not, we don't change. We are who we are, who we are forever. So this is just a world of names. It's, things are constantly changing. It seems slow to us, but in terms of universal time, they're constantly changing. And as they change, they just get different names. So in chapter 2, it's explained, even after this whole meditation on the form of the universe, 
that meditation on the Lord in the heart is superior. Because if you just meditate on the Lord as a universe, it's not necessarily going to invoke love. But if you meditate on the Lord in the heart, there's going to be a feeling of love. And here's this wonderful meditation on the super soul. His mouth expresses his happiness. His eyes spread like the petals of a lotus. And his garments, yellowish like the saffron of a kadamba flower, are bedecked with valuable jewels. His lotus feet are placed over the whirls of the lotus-like hearts of great mystics. On his chest is a kastuba jewel engraved with a beautiful calf. The Lord's magnanimous pastimes and the glowing glance of his smiling face are all indications of his extensive benedictions. Now, Also in this chapter, there is discussion of different kinds of liberation. You can mer merge all the material elements into yourself. We talked about liberation through sound, reversing the elements, then merging the self into the Lord. Or you can do a gradual process where you raise the life air to the top of the head and go from one planet to another. Like yesterday, Gopal Kumar kept going from one planet to another to go to Vaikuntha. You can also go uh, from one planet to another and merge into Mahavishnu, moving the life air up through from the Muladhar up to the Sahasra Chakra, right? from the red up to the yellow, to the green, to the sky blue to the deep blue, and to the indigo, and to the sastra. And it's explained that when such a mystic passes over the Milky Way by the Shashumna, Shashumna is the pathway in the back, in the spine, and it's also a pathway in the universe, that he goes first to the deity of fire, and then he goes to the, to the Sishumara, and then he goes to be with Lord Hari. So this is a path of gradual liberation. Someone asked me the other day, why are different paths indicated in the Shastra? Because not everybody will take the most direct path. So therefore, these different paths are given. And then this wonderful verse at the end of chapter 2, Jiva Goswami identifies this verse as the concluding verse of the Bhagavatam. Although it's just at the end of the second chapter of the second canto. <laughs> it's not at the end of the twelfth canto. And he says, really, in one sense, the Bhagavatam ends at this point. And then Maharaj Prickett goes and asks more questions. But this is the conclusion of the Bhagavatam. So a wonderful verse to learn. Pivantiye Bhagavata Atmana Satam. Why don't we say it together? Pivantiye Bhagavata Atmana Satam. Katam Rita Shravana Puteshu Sam Britam. Punanti Te Vishaya Vidu Sitat Swayam. Vrajanti Chach Charana Saro Ruhantikam. So Pivanti means to drink. So you drink this Bhagavatam. It's like a very nectarian drink. Katamrita. Amrita means a nectar. Mrita means death. Amrita. It saves you from death. So this wonderful drink that saves you from death. I mean, they may advertise that if you drink some green smoothie, it'll save you from death, but I don't think so. But this Bhagavatam will actually do that. And it will get you out of this path of vishaya, this path of trying to enjoy the senses within this world. And touch um, charana will bring you to the lotus feet of the Lord. So moving on to chapter 3. Chapter 3 talks about uh, different kinds of inferior sadhana. So worship, karma yoga to the demigods. Or karma yoga to go to the Brahman. And in chapter 3, it gives you a whole list. If you want this material desire, worship this demigod. If you want this material desire, worship this demigod. If you have this material desire... Worship this demigod. And then it ends with, if you have broader intelligence, whether you are sarvakama, akama, whether you're mokshakama, whether you want liberation, whether you want everything in the world, or whether you just want bhakti, you should worship Krishna. And this means, people often ask the question, if I have a material desire, what should I do with it? Ask Krishna. Ask Krishna. Go to Krishna with your material desire. Better than going someplace else. Or better than going to Krishna and pretending you don't have any material desire. Krishna, please give me pure devotional service. And in your heart, you're saying, I really want that red jaguar. <laughs> that doesn't work. Better to go to Krishna and say, Krishna, I really want the red jaguar. And then with the mood of Krishna, whatever you like. Rather than trying to get it independently. And the best thing is to say, Krishna, I wish I could ask for pure devotional service. Unfortunately, I also want the red jaguar. You, please... Do with it as you like. Give it to me or not as you like. And then you walk away and you forget about it. And then see what he does. So here's a nice about a children in Krishna consciousness. About Maharaj Parikit 
who was worshiping the deity from a young age. And Prabhupada talks about in that purport how he was also trained like this by his parents. So there's never been a religious system in the world that succeeded and prospered without children. It's never happened. If we put our energy as far as our Krishna consciousness movement into trying to bring people to Krishna consciousness just from the adult society, we will not succeed, historically speaking. So have, encouraging our members to have children, encouraging even them to have a lot of children, not like modern society, you know, maybe you want just one or two. And then having facility for the children, that means facility in the temple building itself, facility in the community is very important. Then this very famous verse that Prabhupada says a lot, that the sun diminishes the duration of life for everyone except for the devotees. For the devotees, everything we're doing is eternal. Everything we're doing is spiritual, and therefore it stays forever. But if one is simply a materialist, everything you're doing is just like a sandcastle. It doesn't have any meaning. And the examples given is just like you know, the, the bellows in the blacksmith shop, they appear to be breathing. The tree lives for a long time. The bull is eating, it's reproducing. But what is the use of that life? And otherwise, you live just life like the examples given, the hog, dog, the camels, or the ass. Without much profit, your eyes become like peacock feathers and your ears become like a frog's ears that can't actually hear anything. It doesn't, you're not getting any profit, you're not gaining anything. At the end of life, what do you have? You know, you're in an old age home and nobody comes to visit you anymore. And, you know, when you die, they have two sentences in the newspaper, please come to the funeral. You know, survived by his wife and two children. And that's it for your whole life. And life goes on. And, and all the things you did and all the important things just become uh, useless. But not for the devotee, where everything is eternal and everything is part of our relationship with Krishna. Oh, and then this verse in the third chapter. That if when we're chanting the holy name of the Lord, if when we're chanting the holy name of the Lord, sometimes we cry, our hair stands on end, but if our heart doesn't change, that means our heart's made of steel. What to speak of if you chant and you don't even cry? If you chant and you cry, but your heart doesn't melt, what is the point? And if you chant and you don't even have any, any reaction, what is the point? Hmm? That means your heart is made of steel. And one can say, well, I'm not committing any offenses. And then one can say, well, why isn't one's heart melting? That is the evidence, huh? Okay, going on to chapter 4. So Mars Prickett is very detached. He's not eating, he's not drinking, he's not sleeping. He's just fully absorbed in hearing the Bhagavatam. And he says, I want to know more about the Lord. And Sukadeva Goswami then glorifies the Lord, and he's going to repeat Narada and Brahma's comments. And this, of course, is a very important verse in this chapter. That even very low-class people, very sinful people, if they take shelter of the Lord, can become completely purified. Om Mahapravitra Pravitra Vasavasta Hom Gato Biva Yat Smart Pundari Kaksham Yabayan Yantarasuti Sri Vishnu Sri Vishnu Sri Vishnu. That purified or unpurified, or even having passed through all situations, one who remembers the lotus eyed Lord is purified within and without. So, this is our principle. And this is such an important principle. I've talked a lot about pure bhakti versus mixed bhakti. Mixed bhakti says, first you have to be purified and then you can think of Krishna. And bhakti says, start thinking of Krishna and thinking of Krishna will purify you. Even if you're the most sinful of all sin sinners, even if you're very degraded, uh, what, whoever, whoever you are, whatever you are, simply by absorption in the Lord, that is enough to accomplish everything. Then going on to chapter 5. Here we have a wonderful description of the primary creation for Mahavishnu. You know, there's a big controversy in the world. How did the universe come about? Was it just God said, let there be creation, or was there some exploding chunk? Or, and generally they think it's the, you're simply having to decide between the exploding chunk and the nothingness, or the God who just said, let there be creation. Because in most of the, of the modern world, they think the only creation story is the biblical creation story. 
and uh, n without any quarrel with the biblical creation story, it's very uh, much of a summary. Hmm? It's, it's kind of like if you said, okay, we're going to build this kitchen. Ani Rudi Prabhu came and gave a talk, let's build the kitchen, and then there was a kitchen. Yeah. Like sometimes people ask me, how did you become a devotee? I said, well, I read the Bhagavad Gita and I became a devotee. But if I really tell the story, it's about 4,000 words, I know, because I've written it down. But I could say, I got a Bhagavad Gita and I became a devotee. So you can say, God said, okay, let there be creation, and there was creation. Or you can give the details. So these details are given in this chapter. How does the creation come about? All of the different aspects of creation. What creates what? How is it created? So again, if one has some, some mind for science and just being able to look at the creation through this lens of how did God create. You all know this is a summary of the second canto, right? We're not like learning the whole second canto. Okay, so you, don't, you don't expect me to go into detail on all this, right? Good. Okay, going to chapter six. Again, we have the universal form in chapter six. So there's a, a real emphasis in the second canto on the universal form. And how important, the, again, this first and second canto are the lotus feet of the Lord. How important it is to first see the Lord in the world around us. I don't think he's here right now. But somebody made the comment in class the other day. He said, if my wife is suffering, I can't just go up to her and say, all your suffering is an illusion. You're not really suffering. She'll get angry. You know, first I have to be empathetic. So it's very much like that. Before you can say to people, all right, let's go see God in the spiritual world, you have to say, let's first see God where you are. You're seeing material things. You're interacting with this world. How do you see God in the world? And once you start seeing God in the world, which he is in the world, then you can start also seeing God beyond the world. Chapter 7 then goes to the personal incarnations of Krishna, beyond just how Krishna is manifested in the world. All the pastime avatars, even Hayagriva and Hamsa. And this is a wonderful chapter to read. And if, if you want a whole overview of Krishna's pastimes incarnations, you read this chapter in, in, the, in the Bhagavatam, the seventh chapter in the second canto. Really, really nice. Or if you know if it's the appearance day of a particular incarnation and you want a little summary, you get a verse in that chapter that's a summary of the whole incarnation. And then there's some more detailed descriptions, especially of Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. So if you say, well, I don't have time to read the whole Bhagavatam, but I'd really like to find some place to meditate on Krishna, this particular chapter is a great place. If you wanted to find some, a chapter that you were going to memorize in the Bhagavatam just for your own meditation... Um, this chapter isn't such good for memorization as, as preaching verses. We've mentioned some of those in the beginning in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. But especially here for meditation verses uh, and, on, and meditation on Krishna would be that chapter. Then going on to chapter 8. So here Maharaj asks some important questions. And it's interesting because we're now reading in the Bhagavatam in Canto 3, very similar questions being asked by Vidura to Maitreya. And this, of course, is the main question that everybody asks. What am I doing here? You know, how did I get this body? Why am I suffering here? What's my purpose here? Isn't that the question? Yes? All other questions are secondary. You know, what should I eat for lunch? And what should I have as my career? And should I marry this girl or that girl? You know, all of those are secondary to this one. What am I doing here? You know, all of a sudden, here I was in this body, in this family, and why do I have this body? Why am I in this world? Is it an accident or is there some cause? So he has quite a lot of questions. And then he also says, anything I didn't ask, but that would be important, you please tell me. And then the rest of the Bhagavatam is going to be an answer to all of these questions. 
So Sukhdev Goswami is going to be going, and there's uh, my godbrother Suhotra Maharaj has analyzed for each question which verse answers it. You know, there's this, this question in this verse, and this answer in this verse that goes together, and this question in this verse, and this answer in this verse that goes together. You can see exactly which verse is answering what question. And in chapter 9, we get to the four nutshell verses of the Bhagavatam. So if you only know one thing in the Bhagavatam, you should know these verses. Not necessarily you have to know the Sanskrit, but at least you should know the English, and at least know the meaning and the philosophy of these verses. Just like in the Bhagavad Gita, we also have four nutshell verses in the 10th chapter, yes? 8, 9, 10, and 11. So this is about how Brahma was enlivened from within the heart by Lord Vishnu. It's just such a wonderful, wonderful chapter. How he was told to do tapasya, how he did austerity, how after his austerity he went to visit, visit Vaikuntha. And when he went to visit Vaikuntha, the Lord spoke to him such an amazing verse. He says, Tapo me redayan sakshat atmaham tapaso naga. Naga is, ref is referring to Brahma. Tapo me ridayam sakshat. What does ridaya mean? Heart. Sakshat? Directly. So tapasya is directly my heart, the Lord says. And then he says, atmaham tapaso. Atma means self and aham, I. I myself am directly tapasya. Tapasya is my heart and I am directly tapasya. So this is very much like the verse in the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Sarvagatam Brahma, Nitya Yagya Pratistitam. God who is everywhere can be, count, be found in sacrifice. Now this is of course very uh, strange. The word tapa literally means suffering. It also has something to do with heat, with fire. The same with yagya. Yagya, sacrifice. If you think of sacrifice, you think of difficulty, right? I'm going to undertake some sacrifice. I'm going to undertake some penance. I mean, here, Prabhupada's translating this as penance. Penance usually means I've done something wrong, and therefore I rectify it with some taking some trouble. Why would God always be found in things like sacrifice and austerity and penance? I would think you'd find God in celebration and joy and light and, yes? God is an undermine of Yasad. He's always joyful. He's full of joy. Why is he found in austerity and penance? Anybody have some idea? Why is he saying, this is my very heart? Hmm? Oh, that's, for, that's for our purification. Why is it equal to God? Yeah. I think uh, because uh, God uh, sustains everything. This is so nice. Who is the biggest giver? Krishna. I mean, we can be a philanthropist. I can be very proud. You know, I've just given $10,000 to this or something. Well, if you're really a big philanthropist, you know, I've given a million whatever. I've given 10 million. I've given 90% of my wealth in charity, whatever. But who can be a bigger giver than Krishna? And why is he giving? Yeah. Love. Only love. Only love. The greatest joy is to be found in love, and love is expressed through giving. That's what it means to love. Isn't it? Huh? Unconditionally. Giving unconditionally. Yes, that's what it means to, to love. Giving without expectation of return, without even expectation of gratitude or acknowledgement. I mean, Krishna is giving to all of us. Even we may, are we acknowledging Krishna in every breath of air? I'm not even noticing that we're breathing. We don't even notice it. I mean, I met one friend of mine who's now on dialysis. You know what that means to be on dialysis? It means you can't urinate anymore. And he was saying, oh, I'd be so grateful if I could just urinate again. And I was saying, you know, we, we just don't even think about it. 
I digest my food and I can urinate and I can see and I can hear and I can move my hands and I have food to eat. Everybody have enough food to, food to eat? Do you eat different things every day or do you eat exactly the same thing every day? Different things. Do you wear exactly the same clothes every day or do you have different clothes? Do you want just one set of clothes? You know? So he's giving so much. He's giving so much. So this is joy. How interesting. Materially, we think that, that joy... Materially, we think that joy means that I take from myself. That's what materially we think that joy means. That I will get happiness by taking as much as possible. But Krishna, who's a supreme happiness, is giving as much as possible. And if you want to find God, you find God in sacrifice and in giving, out of love. Not sacrifice and giving in a calculated way, but sacrifice and giving out of love. So Brahma asked some questions. He asked about the spiritual material forms of the Lord. He asked about Maya and Yoga Maya. He asked how the Lord carries out his pastimes, and he asked for instructions. And the Acharyas say that, that Krishna answers in four verses so that materialists won't understand. <laughs> all, all of the scriptures are like that. They're kind of in these layers that you really under, only understand when you go deep into them. Anyway, that's fun. Not only is it efficient that you can give many layers of instruction with one verse to many different people. It's very efficient, yes? One instruction that can be understood differently by a lot of people. But it's also a whole lot of fun. Don't you like communicating in code with somebody and other people around that understand what you're saying? Isn't that enjoyable? <laughs> so Krishna also likes that. Okay, this is Krishna's introduction to the Chatur Sloka. He said, now I'm going to tell you these secrets, rahasyam. Krishna uses this word also in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, text 3, rahasyam. Arjuna, I'm going to give you this rahasyam, the secret, because you are my devotee, bhaktosime uh, sakacheti. And also understand about prema and sadhana bhakti. And then Krishna is saying, I, by my mercy, you will attain all this realization. This is true even for material things. You cannot attain understanding of even material things without the grace of God giving realization. Okay, his first question. I want to understand your, your spiritual and material forms even though you have no material forms. Remember we talked about the universal form. That's a material form. Okay, so this is the first answer. Aham eva sam eva gre nan yad yat sa dasak param pas aham yat de touch chayo it is I who existed before the creation when there was nothing but myself, nor was ever the material nature the cause of this creation. That which you see now is also I, the personality of Godhead. After annihilation, what remains will also be I, the personality of Godhead. So that's it. Before creation, here's another translation. This is by Banu Swami. So this is it. Before the creation, there's only Krishna. During the creation, there's only Krishna. After the creation, there's only Krishna. There's nothing but Krishna. Now, of course, we don't generally emphasize this in our Hare Krishna movement because Srila Prabhupada came, Nirvasesa Sunivadi, to destroy impersonalism and voidism. So mostly we emphasize the difference, not the oneness. But we do not believe in absolute difference. We believe in a Jintabeda Beda Tattva which is simultaneous oneness and difference. This is about the oneness. So here Krishna is saying, I am the universe. I am the universe. Because God and his energy are the same. God and his energy are the same. So during the creation, there's only Krishna. There's nothing else. At the same time, the Lord exists before the creation and after the creation in a spiritual form. So he exists as the material form of the creation, as the universal form, and before and after in a spiritual form. And Prabhupada really uh, emphasizes these words, aham, and I alone existed. So the argument given here is when you say Krishna ex exists before, during, and after, even if he's not performing the activities of creation, still he exists. 
And he has the forms in the spiritual world by his spiritual potency and in the material world by his material potency. Then Srila Prabhupada gives all sorts of evidences in his purport that this statement of the Bhagavatam is factual. He's quoting other shastras. And then this example is given, just like the spider with the web. The web is nothing but the spider, yes? Can you say the web is not the spider? The web is the spider. It comes from the spider's body. It's part of the spider's body. And yet, it's not the spider. <laughs> right? So it's a spider, and it's not the spider. So this material creation is nothing but the Lord. And yet, it's different from the Lord. Hmm. So this is Brahma's question. And here is the answer. O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it was without relation to me, has no reality. No, it is my illusory energy, that reflection, which appears to be in darkness. This is the answer as to what is illusion. We talked about this in the morning class. What is illusion? Illusion means to see that there's something that's separated from Krishna. If I perceive my body, myself, the speaker, this floor, anything, as separate from Krishna, that is illusion. And of course, it's not just, a, oh, everything's related to Krishna. But it's practically using everything for Krishna. That I'm not an illusion is demonstrated by what do I do with everything in the world. So here's Banu Swami's translation by whose power real objects are perceived through knowledge and false objects are perceived through ignorance, just as light reveals objects and darkness hides them. Or one should understand my yoga maya by whose power some objects are revealed and some objects hidden from the person who's realized the Lord, just as light reveals objects and darkness hides them. So the material energy is hiding things and yoga maya is revealing things. So Maya, we were talking about this also in our morning classes, that the material energy acts somewhat favorably and partially unfavorably. It depends on how you're dealing with the material energy. And once you realize that the super soul is everywhere, then you're not under Mahamaya, then you're under Yoga Maya. And here's the example. Again, there's a spider in the web. Now here's a snake in its skin. The snake's skin then becomes as if it wasn't living, but it came from something that's living. So although the material world comes from Krishna, at the same time, it's not identified with his spiritual form. Although both are coming from the Supreme Lord, the material maya acts like this discarded snake skin. Maybe I should have like a real picture of a snake here. I don't know. So Mahamaya helps and hinders, helps with knowledge and hinders with ignorance. Now what's interesting is that ignorance doesn't destroy anything real, it just covers them. The fact that everything is Krishna and Krishna is everywhere that's not destroyed by illusion. We just can't see it. We just can't perceive it anymore. We're just simply prevented from perceiving it. And we've been, this is a lot of what we've been talking about in Bhagavatam class the last few days. That in ignorance you think, I'm the body and I'm suffering. Which is not true. The truth is I'm not this body and I don't suffer. That's the truth. But avidya covers us, so we think, I'm this body, and I am suffering. So if you have knowledge, and as explained in this part of the Bhagavatam, whether it's jnana, sankhya, yoga, tapasya, if it's mixed with a little bhakti, you realize the self, you become liberated, and by the mercy of the Lord, you will attain the paramatma. So again, the same translation just as light reveals objects and darkness hides them. So it's like you're in a room, and if there's darkness, you can't see something. But it's still there in the room. It's not that it's not there. You just can't see it because of the darkness. 
Now, of course, there's also yoga maya. Yoga maya also covers some aspects of Krishna. Just like in yoga maya, you may think Krishna is my child and I have to feed him or he's going to die. But the purpose is an exchange of love. Whereas when Mahamaya covers Krishna, there's no spiritual purpose. The purpose is so you can pretend to enjoy separately from Krishna. And here, of course, is this example of Mother Yasoda. That Mother Yasoda, Mother Yasoda sees the whole material universes within Krishna's mouth, but she doesn't lose her feeling of love for Krishna. She just still thinks, oh, my son is so wonderful. Right? So this is an action of yoga maya. She revealed the material universes. She also revealed the spiritual universes. And Yoga Maya perceived it and then didn't perceive it. Madhya sort of perceived it and then didn't perceive it under the realm of Yoga Maya, but it was all to increase love. This is a universal form. So Arjuna, when he saw the universal form, his prema was restricted. Right? He didn't feel so much that he was like Krishna's friend. And when he saw the universal form, he wasn't able to see the original form of Krishna, even though that was still present. And later he had to say, Krishna, please show me your universal form. So again, this is talking about revealing and covering. There's another example of when Brahma stole the boys and the calves. So this was the action of yoga maya in order to reveal to Lord Brahma that he wasn't the controllers. So yoga maya made the real ones invisible and showed boys and calves that were Krishna to Lord Brahma, revealing and not revealing. And Brahma was like, I can't handle this display of yoga maya. Okay, then next question of Lord Brahma. Please give me the intelligence to understand your material and spiritual pastimes. And Krishna's answer, know that the universal elements enter into the cosmos at the same time do not enter. Also, I myself exist within everything and at the same time I am outside of everything. So this is the answer to the philosophical questions of what we call immanence and transcendence. So in Western knowledge, they talk about immanence. Immanence is God is everywhere. He's entered into everything. Everything is God. Transcendence is God has nothing to do with this world. He's just separate up in the clouds. And both of these philosophies are faulty. If God's just everywhere and everything, how do I have a relationship with him? So, okay, everything's spiritual, but, but how is it a personal relationship? And if he's just separate, you know, the world is over here and it's evil and God is over there and he's good. Well, how do I connect anything with God? Then, then the world's just sort of this place of evil until I die and get to go be with God. But here we see he's both. Because he's separate, I can have a relationship with him and take the things of the world and offer them to him. And because he's everywhere in the world, the things in the world have value when used in his service. If he wasn't also everywhere, how could I offer him the things of the world? They would have nothing to do with him. So this a verse can also be translated, that just as the elements enter into all beings and also remain separate, I enter into all beings and remain separate. In past times related to the material world, I'm detached. And in past times related to the devotees, I am attached. This, is, this verse is very deep. I mean, this is, this is the kind of verse you could really get into for a month or a year. How is it that the unattached, self-sufficient Lord feels attachment to his devotees. If you have everything, would you be attached to anything? If you yourself are the source of anything, but yet he's attached to his devotees. And this is compared to the fire element, which produces all kinds of lamps, all kinds of fire. So like Krishna produces everything within the world, that fire pervades everything. So without attachment in relation to the elements and the living beings within the material world. Mm. This is very sweet. This is by Vishnu Chakravati Thakur in his commentary. He's saying that what Krishna is saying is, my pastimes are without attachment in relation to the elements and the living beings within the material world. That Krishna is saying, I have no desire to enjoy anything within the world. But I, want, I do want to show myself to my obedient devotees who have entered my heart, 
who have perfected themselves and who bow to me. Sometimes not entering their hearts, I remain separate so that they can see my form. This is another way of explaining. When Krishna is saying, I enter into everything, and yet I haven't entered into everything. And here we're looking at some of the layers of meaning. We can think of that, okay, that's a philosophical concept that God is everywhere and yet he's separate. But it's also talking about this relationship of rasa and love of the Lord and his devotees. Okay, as long as you're detached from me, I'm somewhat detached from you. But if you're attached to me, then I'm going to be within your heart, but I'm also going to come outside your heart and show myself to you personally. And this is also very nicely explained to Madhurya Kanambani, how at the stage of bhava, that one is seeing the Lord within the heart, at the stage of prema, the Lord removes himself from the heart and comes before the senses of the devotee. Can you think of what devotees in the Bhagavatam had this experience? They were meditating on the Lord in the heart, then he disappeared. And they, Narada and Dhruva. And then, oh, wait, wait a minute, I was meditating on him in my heart, and now he's gone. He's, where'd he go? And then, oh, there he is. And Vishnu Chakravati going on, I desire that my fragrance enters their nostrils and desire to fill their ears with the nectar of my sweet voice, speaking with them and answering them. I desire to make their limbs experience the sweet softness of my body by touching and embracing them. So for this purpose, the Lord reveals himself outside to the devotees. And this is fascinating. I mean, the concept here is that the Lord becomes the object of pleasure for the devotees. Instead of taking pleasure in the energy of the Lord, Krishna wants us to take pleasure in him. And we can think of this again in terms of even our material relationships. Right, let's say you have some very rich person and you're enjoying their, you know, you're a guest in this rich person's house and you're enjoying their delicious food and their swimming pool and riding around in their limousine, but you don't spend any time with them. Would they be happy? No. So they're saying, hey, you know, did you just come to enjoy my energy or did you come to enjoy me? Right? Now, Krishna doesn't want us to enjoy him in an exploitive way, but he wants us to enjoy his presence because we really... Isn't that part of love, that you like being with somebody? You enjoy their company? Isn't that one way you know somebody loves you? They like hanging out with you? Yes. So Krishna very much wants to give his devotees this pleasure of his vision, his fragrance, his touch, his sound, and so forth. Uh, directly, and here we are just trying to enjoy the energy and not even the superior energy, we're trying to enjoy the inferior energy. Okay, then Brahma's question. He said, I want to carry out your instructions without lethargy. I want to have enthusiasm and not false pride. So this is, I think, one of our main questions also. How can I always be enthusiastic in spiritual life without false pride? And then here's the answer. A person who's searching after the supreme absolute truth, the personality of Godhead, most certainly, should most certainly search for it up to this in all circumstances, in all space and time, and both directly and indirectly. And especially Vishnu Chakravati Thakur goes into a real deep, again, understanding of this. He says, if you want to know the best sadhana and the best prema, you have to surrender to guru. The learning positive results by performance lack of results by non-performance, and in all times and in all places. This verse particularly talks about how bhakti is available to everyone, that one should search out the absolute truth in all times and all places and in all circumstances. And we're going right back to that verse that we had had earlier, right? In chapter 3, Akama Sarva Kamava, Moksha Kamu Dharadi, Tivarena Bhakti Yogena, Yajeta Purusham Puram, that if you really have Udharadri, if you really have developed intelligence, no matter who you are, no matter what desires you have, one should go to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Okay, that those who don't have bhakti, they can't, they can't get any real benefits. This is also in the second canto in chapter 4. One has to look for Krishna everywhere. Without looking for Krishna, whatever else you do, it won't give you anything tangible. It is also explained in the 17th chapter. Ashradaya hutam datam. Anything that's not connected with Krishna will leave. Because anything not connected with Krishna is what? Illusion. It's not real. 
So anything you do without connection with Krishna, it's not going to lead to any kind of tangible benefit. So Krishna is saying, in all times, in all places, and for all people. So if we want to compare bhakti to other things in terms of time, so in terms of time, fruit of activities is done until you get your fruit, then you stop doing them. So it's not done at all times. You work, you get what you wanted to get, and then you stop. You can't say it's eternal. Yoga is also practiced until you get your powers, then you stop. Now, you know, Harani Kashipu went and did his yoga. When he got his bed, he stopped. He didn't keep doing yoga anymore. Right? Sankhya is performed only until you get knowledge. You're analyzing philosophy. And once you, once you understand it, you stop. Right? You go to school, you take your courses, you get your degree, and then you don't go to school anymore. Jnana is performed only until you're liberated. Then you're not engaged in jnana. But bhakti is performed always. So this is when Krishna is talking about, they should search for me at all times. Also, all kinds of people, even those who are interested in karma and jnana, even those who are fallen, those who are elevated, those who are intelligent, those who are foolish, those who are healthy, those who are crippled, those who are sane, those who are not so sane. <laughs> Anybody. The other practices can only be done by certain people. You can only do jnana if you're a very developed philosopher. You can only do astanga yoga if you're already very detached. You can only do karma if you're very pious. But bhakti, anybody can do bhakti. And in all stages of life. Prahlad in the womb, Dhruva when he was a young boy, Ambarish when he was a youth, Ajamil at the last moment. Any place. You can do bhakti in Melbourne. You can do bhakti in Vrindavan. You can do bhakti in a boat in the ocean. You can do bhakti in your house, you can do bhakti in your car, you can do bhakti anywhere. Uh, that's the meaning in regard to sadhana. Another meaning of this verse is in regard to rasa. So if you want the highest truth, you'll experience this rasa, this relationship, which has bliss in meeting and separation, and which continues in all places eternally. Vishnu Chakravati Thakur describes the meaning of this verse in this way. Among all things desired to be known, one should desire the highest realization of rasa, which will be tasted in servitude, friendship, parental, and conjugal, by direct contact and in separation in all places, in all universes. In all places like Vrindavan, in the presence of servants, friends, elders, and gopis at all time, continually, even when the universe is destroyed. So here we're looking at the layers of meaning in this verse, right? One layer of meaning is you should always try to achieve God no matter who you are and where you are. Another meaning is in regard to sadhana. Sadhana bhakti can be done anywhere, anytime, by any person at any stage of life. And another meaning is this relationship, this sweet relationship with Krishna, this rasa on very high levels of bhakti can also exist anywhere, at any place, at any time in both union and separation. And this is explained by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. What is the process of attaining rasa, the meeting and separation of the cows and the cowherd boys who are all expansions of Krishna. Then yet another meaning. This verse can also be understood in terms of jnana, in terms of liberation. If you want to know the self, if you want to know Brahman, then you should seek out the self which, which exists in all places and at all times, and... Uh, which is not different from the Atma, and in the Atma, not different from the universe. So uh, someone else, can, a jnana yogi, can read the Bhagavatam, and then they get a different meaning from this verse. Isn't that nice that Krishna can do this? Going on to chapter 10. Here, chapter 10 gives the definition of what is a Purana. This is the Bhagavat Purana. So what does it mean to be a Purana? And another description of the universal form. Three descriptions of the universal form in this canto. And here's the Sanskrit list of all of the 10 parts of the Bhagavatam. And here are the different parts of the Purana. So, Sarga Visarga, Stana Posana Uti, Manvantara, Ishanukata, Nirodha Mukti, and Ashraya. Creation, that means the big creation, secondary creation, the maintenance of the creation, the mercy of the Lord the impressions of the jiva, the conduct of the manus, or the maintainers of the universe, the stories of the incarnations, the destruction, 
liberation and the ultimate shelter. So in order for something to be called a Purana, it has to have all of these parts in it. And all of these parts are existing in this Bhagavad Purana. So this is described in this chapter very, very briefly. And then there's another description of the universal form. And here again, the relationship between the senses, the sense objects, and the living entities. How do we perceive anything? That we perceive anything through the senses of the universal form as acting through the particular demigods in the universe. So this was a very quick run through the second canto. We were really kind of racing at top speed. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed this. It'd be nice to have one of these eventually for every canto of the Bhagavatam. So thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki.